evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Gazing Gators event. Our program will now begin. Hello and good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to our first ever Gazing Gators event. My name is Nicole Lang. I'm the Associate Vice President of Alumni Relations and University Engagement at the university where I've worked for the last seven years. Um, I am also a very proud alumna of the university. And in fact, tonight I am joining you from campus where we've started to come back to. We'd love to know where you're at though. So if you wanted to let us know, just go ahead and take to the chat and tell us where um, you all are at tonight. Now, tonight with our hosts, Jessica Agnos and Hamza Khan, we're going to learn about the Perseid meteor shower, which is going to be at its peak tomorrow night. They will also share their research on galactic archeology, span which pieces together the origins of the galaxy by looking at populations of stars and their chemical compositions. And we also love the opportunity to compete so there's going to be a quick Kahoot trivia game after the program, and the top three winners will win an alumni swag bag. Instructions on how to download Kahoot are in the chat right now. Okay, before we dive into our program, I want to highlight some campus news. First, if you haven't heard, SF State is in the midst of designing and constructing a new science building. This will be the first STEM building constructed in SF State at SF State in over 50 years. The science building will provide vital new teaching labs and classrooms and is designed to achieve LEED Gold certification. Science faculty, staff, and students will no longer have to overcome the limitations of working in antiquated labs which uh, as an aside, I'm a little bummed that 50 is considered antiquated, but we will, uh, I'll put that aside for tonight. <laughs> These uh, new spaces will set the stage for a bright and innovative future. To learn more about our science building and our other capital planning projects, follow the link um, in the chat right now. In other news, last month, Governor Newsom signed the API equity budget which includes $10 million for the nonprofit Stop AAPI Hate, which was co-founded by SF State professor, professor of Asian American Studies, Dr. Russell Jung. Stop AAPI Hate is a national coalition that addresses anti-Asian and Pacific Islander racism and hate in the US. When talking about SF State's partnership with Stop AAPI Hate, Dr. Zhang says this effort and the this effort, I'm sorry, and the research initiative contain the legacy of the SF State strike. It's working for the liberation of all, doing community-based research and advocating for racial change. To learn more about Stop AAPI Hate, their work, and SF State's involvement. Follow the link that's being put into the chat. Um, I also want to remind everyone that the Alumni Relations Office is in the midst of our summer series. So if you enjoy events like tonight's Gazing Gators, be sure to check out our full calendar of activities and events. There's a link in the chat. And at the end of tonight's program, we're going to put up a QR code um, where you can uh, scan that and find a little bit more information. Some of the events that you can look forward to are our red, white, and barbecue event on August 24th, where SF State chef Tim Shaw is going to make a grilled fish with mango salsa and rice. And there's going to be a vegetarian option of uh, nop uh, nopales cactus and chayote squash. You can also join our Gator Great a uh, book club where we are currently reading A House is a Body by alumna Shruti Swami. And you can participate in our alumni scavenger hunt, download coloring pages, and so much more. Um, if you enjoy our virtual programming, be sure to check out our YouTube page where you can find recordings of our past and might I add, I'm gonna add our award-winning uh, events. 
So from interview, we've got interviews with alumni and faculty authors, to foodie demonstrations and virtual tours. There's all kinds of programming centered around SF State and our Gator Grades. So go ahead, follow that link in the chat and start exploring. Okay, now why we're really all here tonight. It is my great pleasure to introduce our first galactic tour guide, Jessica Agnos. Jessica is currently a master's student at SF State studying astrophysics with a research interest in galactic archeology. span She received her undergraduate degree from St. John's University in Queens, New York in television and film production. Jessica is a founding and active member of Astronomers for Planet Earth and a member of the American Astronomical Society's Sustainability Committee. Together with other members of SF State's Physics and Astronomy Department, she established STEM STARS, a tutoring program that offers math support to local elementary students. Okay, please join me and give a big gator welcome to Jessica Agnos. Hello, everyone. I'm making sure that I can um, share my screen. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, so we're gonna jump right in. Uh, when you see this picture, how does it make you feel? Why are people drawn to astronomy? What is it about outer space that captivates us so much? Um, honestly, for me, it's a privilege that I get to study astronomy. And I know that because I came to this department a bit later in life than most people come to this profession. Um, I was a teenage mom. <laughs> you know, I never thought I'd be here, uh, but I am. And I'm so happy to be at SF State. The physics and astronomy department is filled with faculty and students who think about what impact they can make on this world right now. And that's the spirit that launched two endeavors that I'm deeply involved with here. So one is a tutoring program that came about because our students realized how much we were struggling to learn effectively during the pandemic. And we were concerned about what effect this had on kids and what the ripple effect will be. How will this affect the pipeline of students to have the confidence enough to declare that these pursuits like physics and astronomy aren't something to be intimidated by, aren't meant for someone else, but instead to be explored by them. You know, so we're tapping into our diverse student body to work with elementary students and show them that they belong in this field of study if they choose to be. Representation matters. And this department knows that, which is how STEM stars came to be. So we work with students at a local elementary school to offer math and moral support. Um, and we just got off the ground last school year and it will be continuing this academic year, hopefully bringing in tutors from other departments of the College of Science and Engineering to join us. The second endeavor is Astronomers Planet Earth. We call ourselves A for E for short. And we're a group of astronomers from all over the planet dedicated to combating the climate crisis. We use the astronomical perspective and our knowledge of physical processes to communicate how special and fragile Earth is and make it clear that there really is no planet B. I know that we had uh, exoplanet things uh, happening in the, in the pre-show, but y'all, we can't go. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. <laughs> so A for E was first announced on SF State's campus October 18th, 2019, during the annual meeting of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. In planning this conference, we agreed that we had to make a statement about climate. And it was this idea for a panel that led us to form this group. Not long after this announcement, European astronomers who had formed a similar group found us and we merged under this name. Uh, these are some of our ops team members that steer initiatives through various working groups. And all in all, we have roughly 1300 members and are continuously growing. And we now span 67 countries. So my undergrad is in television film production. My husband, Steve Agnos, he, who is an SF State alum also, uh, works in video production. So we team up um, and make videos for A Free. And I wanna show you one of them that really captures the spirit of who we are. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. 
there is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. said that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world like it or not the earth is where we make our stand responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot the only home we've ever known that's our website <laughs> that's where you can find us across social media and i gotta let my husband's logo come up real quick <laughs> There it is. Okay. Um, so I have to shout out three women, all graduates of, of SF State, who have supported this group and worked side by side with current students and faculty in various ways. The first, Deborah Fisher, who's currently a professor at Yale and a world-renowned exoplanet researcher. Um, she's a founding member, a founding and active member, and announced us at the ASP event in 2019. Linda Shore is CEO of ASP and allowed us to have the space to announce this group. She gave us a platform to speak at their 2020 virtual conference and invited us to partner with, their, uh, with ASP on a day long summer symposium completely centered on climate. At that symposium, which was on July 23rd, this just passed, another alum, NASA astronaut, physician, and retired Air Force Colonel, Dr. Yvonne Cagle, uh, spoke in our closing plenary session, sitting side by side with current undergraduate student Imani Ware so they could have a fireside chat. And that these women who are so accomplished and so in demand, not just give time to their alma mater, but make themselves accessible to its students means more to us than we could ever express. Now, astronomy is my coping mechanism to navigate the constant barrage of negativity in our news feeds and our airwaves. Um, which brings me to my research with Dr. Charlie Sakari, galactic archaeology. I'm sure you're all wondering, what is that? Well. Look around, think of everything you see, you, what you're made of. You are a collection of atoms and elements created in outer space that came together in a massive ball of gas and dust that exploded under the weight of its own gravity to form our sun and some of the leftover stuff clumped together to form the planets and eventually you. So you are sun scraps, fabulous sun scraps, but sun scraps. So archaeology is the study of old artifacts to piece together history. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Ancient stars give us insight into the happenings of the early universe. So do you know why gold and platinum are so rare? It's because the amount of energy it takes to create those elements isn't produced through the normal fusion that happens inside of stars. Something truly cataclysmic must happen. And how are we studying any of this? Starlight. Every single element has its own code embedded in the light we receive from stars, so we can tell what the stars are made of. And think about that. The elements that we have here on Earth are made in various high energy events in space, and we are able to discern what stars have what elements by looking at their light. 
And all of that information helps us figure out how the galaxy was formed. No big deal. <laughs> so this is a graph from my current research on an ancient star and its chemical abundances of what we call the rapid neutron capture elements, which are made from those cataclysmic events I just mentioned. My abundances are in blue. Another star Dr. Sakari looked at is in purple. And they're graphed to show how much they differ from the sun's abundances in those same elements. And looking at these patterns helps us figure out events from the early universe. Now, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. My star is probably over 10 billion years old. This is some humbling stuff, <laughs> or at least it should be. Right? So that's how I want to leave you. Hopefully thinking about the implications of everything I just said. Humanity was born from the stars, quite literally. They're our ancestors. The elements that make up every piece of your body came from out there. Now, astronomy is treated like this out of touch subject, but it dictates every part of your existence. We have a day and experience time the way we do because of the way our planet orbits the sun. It's commonplace to operate as though we're in a snow globe, as ancient people believed, because that's our physical perspective. But I feel it's my duty as an astronomer to shift your perspective, to make you look at this planet for what it is, small and fragile and beautiful and unique, and to look at your fellow human as well as all life on earth for what it is, which is your community. And when you hear Hamza and you go outside to observe the night sky, take it in, contemplate your very being, the oxygen you're breathing, the carbon that is the basis of all life on this planet. Your origins are celestial. So my hope for humanity is that we rise above what we allow to separate us and see each other from this astronomical perspective. Thank you for coming and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jessica. This is just amazing. I'm gonna see if some questions pop into the, um, into the question or the chat, please. Anybody with any questions, go ahead and put that in there. Um, overall, the compliments are already pouring in as they should. Um, you know, how, I, I'm going to kind of try and come up with some questions here for you, but you obviously are so very passionate uh, uh, about this. What, what sparked that in you? Where did, um, it, well, where did that come from? Do you feel? I'm a mother of three. Okay. Right? And so that's, Terrifying. You have a lot of extra time is what you're saying. So much time. <laughs> so much time. Um, but I, I'm from New Orleans, right? And I love, I love my home. I, I, but I left New Orleans in 2005 after Katrina. Like I literally watched my city go underwater. I, we evacuated to Houston and I watched it on the news. I watched my life be submerged. And then I moved to New York. And then like New York is now, you know, at, at, at severe risk. And so it's, you know, these places, these beautiful, and there's people who are suffering and dying now, like climate, we always talk about the climate crisis, like it's, like it's, like it's some far off event, but you know, people are suffering now. And, um, you know, New Orleans really, its its very existence is in jeopardy. Um, and so when I think about my home, when I think about my family, how many houses my mom has lost, how many roofs my sister has had to replace, um, when I think about the my children's future, man, it's, it's just, I, I have to. <laughs> like, I do what I do because I know what I know. And right. physics, being in physics, it's a blessing and a curse because it's like, we know a little too much about energy transfer to, to look at all this and be okay with it. So we have, uh, there's 1300 members of astronomers for planet earth and that's for a reason and there it's growing so we we know that we have to speak up and do anything thank you thank you we, we do have some questions here um there was one about the perseid media shower which i know we're going to get a little bit of information about um from ham mm -hmm. so I'll, i probably will let him take that about how we can best see it but um uh, anita wrote is there a way to tell why our galaxy or any galaxy is formed well, so that's exactly what we're what we're looking at. Um, so there's all kinds of different level, levels to looking at uh, galaxy evolution, galactic evolution, and what we're looking at is the different uh, populations of stars to check their chemical compositions to to see if they're like moving in the same way. And we're it kind of seems as though the Milky Way has been pieced together by various dwarf galaxies throughout the history, the evolution of the um, 
of the universe. Uh, but you know, there are other people who are looking at, say, like the dark matter uh, web and 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 looking into dark energy and the way the universe accelerates. And so, it, you know, when you say astrophysics. Um, there are so many levels to that because it is literally looking all of existence. So we're like in this one little piece where we're looking at stars. <laughs> we're looking at like a little population of stars and then there's other people. And then we write a bunch of papers and we talk about it and then we try to piece together, you know, the whole origins of existence. Oh, is that all? Just the origins of existence. Okay. <laughs> Glad we could wrap that up tonight. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, this was, I mean, I know that this is just the very, very tip of the iceberg, but we really appreciate you joining us tonight and um, hope you'll stick around. We're going to have a little bit more content tonight, but now it is going to be my pleasure to introduce our second galactic tour guide, Hamza Khan. Uh, Hamza is a second generation Muslim American born and raised in the Bay Area. He graduated from SF State in 2020 with a Bachelor of Science degree in astrophysics and is currently in the final year of his master's degree researching galactic archaeology. He is a graduate teaching associate along with Jessica and is a tutor in math, physics and astronomy in the STEM STARS program. Prior to quarantine, uh, he served as a docent at SF State's observatory for two years. Please, everyone help me join uh, in welcoming Hamsa. Uh, thank you, Nicole, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And, uh, and I'm very excited to uh, share with you all uh, some quick, interesting facts and some context um, about the Perseid meteor shower, which is an annual event and uh, it's peaking tonight uh, until August 13th. And uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll be just as excited as I am to view it this week. All right, so just to give a brief overview of my presentation, first we'll um, just run through what exactly a meteor is. And some of you guys probably already know, but we'll just go through some of the naming conventions for the various space rocks, uh, go through some of the uh, details about meteor showers, and then specifically about the Perseids and how to view them and some additional and hopefully helpful observing tips. So uh, let's start off with uh, the largest of the space rocks. Um, the comets and the asteroids. So here we have on the left um, shown the comets, which is uh, essentially just a large dirty snowball made of ice and rock. And uh, they're kind of distinguishable by their bright uh, tail. And uh, asteroids are, are similar to comets, except they're just large chunks of metal and rock. And that's really all we need to know about these. But oh, actually, we also need to know that Comets and asteroids are orbiting the sun, similar to how planets orbit the sun. And as they hurl around the solar system, they collide with other asteroids and comets and other objects, uh, which send streams of debris made of ice and rock uh, across space. And these small pieces of rock that break off of these asteroids and comets are called uh, meteoroids. Now, here's where the naming conventions can get kind of convoluted and frankly, kind of unnecessary, but uh, essentially when these small pieces of rock break off of comets and asteroids, they're called meteoroids. And if the meteoroids hit the atmosphere, uh, they become, uh, well, uh, yeah, if they hit the atmosphere of a planet like Earth, they become meteors, uh, or more commonly known as shooting stars. So shooting stars aren't actually stars um, at all. They're just uh, burning pieces of rock uh, going through the atmosphere. If they manage to make it to Earth, they're called meteorites. But really, the, distinct, the distinctions aren't really that important. Um, I honestly call them meteors wherever they are, but it's just, I guess, a fun fact to know. So how do we get meteor showers then? So as I mentioned before, uh, comets and asteroids orbit the sun, um, just like planets do, except they uh, for example, if we look specifically at the Perseid Comet 109P Swift Tuttle, which is the, the parent of the Perseid showers, you can see uh, it orbiting the sun, which is this 
uh, bright dot here on the left with a smaller oval, light oval, which is the planet Earth's orbit. So we can see that Swift-Tuttle, uh, the comet starts off way out here and then it goes around the sun. And it has a much larger orbit than Earth and it actually takes 133 years to go completely around the sun. So from one side to the other. Uh, and I, you, you might be wondering if this uh, meteor shower is an annual event. Uh, we see the meteor showers every year and the comet takes 133 years to go around. Why do we have a annual event? Why is there meteor showers every year? And why is it in August? So those are good questions because essentially the stream of debris, the meteoroids that are coming off of this comet continue to travel along the orbit of the comet, along the, the road or the highway that the, the comet is traveling on. And every year, uh, the Earth goes around the sun and in the orbit of the Earth intersects with the orbit of the comet. And so it goes through this debris field. Uh, it enters around mid uh, to late July and e exits uh, in the end of August. So it's right in the center around August 11 to 13. So that's where we get the most uh, debris uh, of meteor meteors hitting the, the atmosphere of Earth. Here we have another simulation uh, showing a better um, picture of the of the meteoroids uh, traveling through space. And we can see the blue uh, dot and blue orbit is Earth. And you can see every year it passes through it. It's kind of like uh, the atmosphere of Earth is kind of like the windshield. And the meteors are like uh, rain or snow that's streaking across the, the windshield of Earth's atmosphere as it passes through. So now let's talk more about observing the Perseids. So uh, just even tonight after maybe like an hour after sunset, you can start looking for meteors uh, depending on, on uh, how dark it is where you are. But uh, the moon will be setting soon after sunset and it's also a thin crescent. So even when it's up, it's not gonna be that bright. Uh, but essentially you wanna start looking north uh, and you wanna look for a point in the sky called uh, the radiant. Now the radiant is just a general term for the area or the point of the sky where the meteors appear to originate from. Like they'll be streaking uh, in every direction, uh, seemingly coming from this point. Now as a, a good reference point, uh, you might first want to look for this W-shaped constellation called Cassiopeia. It's pretty distinguishable in the night sky, especially when it's dark. Just look for that W, and then you can use that to guide yourself towards the, the Perseids radiant, which again is just a point in the sky where it appears that the meteors are coming from. Now, as the night goes on, uh, the stars and the, the radiant will rise higher, and you'll be able to see more meteors coming out of the, uh, the radiant. And also per the Perseus constellation will be fully up. So you can see that. That's actually why the meteor shower is called the Perseids. It's, it's named after the constellation where the radiant is. All the meteor showers, or at least um, all that I know of are named after the constellation where the radiant is. And around midnight, uh, between midnight and 4 a.m. you should get the most amount of meteors ranging from 60 to 100, depending on how dark your sky is, uh, 60 an hour, uh, so about maybe one a minute uh, if it's uh, dark enough. But yeah, you can definitely also uh, see some an hour after sunset to midnight uh, in, a, in a dark sky area. All right, so now some general observing tips, uh, starting with eye adjustment. So you want to allow yourself about 20 minutes to adjust to darkness. So that means sitting outside without using your phone or, or flashlight. If you need to use light, um, I would recommend using a red flashlight because uh, not to go too much into depth into this, but essentially the, the cones in your eyes are more sensitive to red light. And uh, so as they are less affected in the dark, um, your eye, eyes don't need to uh, adapt to the dark again if you use a red flashlight. I have seen some people use a red balloon tip over a regular flashlight. And in my experience, they're not super effective, but they're good in the bind. You can also use them as, uh, if you do purchase a, a red flashlight, uh, you can also use them as uh, night lights. And for, you know, at the middle of the night, if you need a, a light, it's perfect. So you can easily go back to sleep. 
just a fun life hack. Uh, I would also definitely recommend using uh, dark sky and light pollution websites, uh, which we can link in the chat as well, a couple of them that I use, uh, to locate you know, some area near you that um, you know, amateur astronomers or uh, other people have found uh, to be good sites of less dark, uh, less light pollution and good visibility of the sky. You really do want to go out away from the city, especially if you're viewing early on, because some of these meteors are going to be really dim. So you want to uh, plan ahead and, and find a location near you. And, and the, the ones in the, the link that we posted, it, and I'm pretty sure it's, it's a global um, you know, database of locations. There's also a bunch of stargazing websites and apps and software that you can use uh, beforehand to uh, look up, look up uh, you know, like it's a kind of like a mini simulation of a planetarium to look at where, which direction certain objects will be. The earlier in the presentation, I was using um, a Stellarium software, which I'll talk ab about in a bit. Um, but I also do want to mention that you don't need to use telescope and binoculars to view the, the meteor shower. In fact, using a telescope might make it more difficult to see them. But if you do have access to a telescope, uh, you can look at Jupiter or Saturn in the south. They look amazing through even the cheapest of telescopes. Uh, you can see the rings of Saturn or the, the moons of Jupiter. Also, if you can't make it out, we also did, I think we did post the, the live stream link for McDonald Observatory, but you can also find live streams from other observatories um, on YouTube. And if so, if you can't make it out, uh, a good alternative would be just to watch it through the live stream. Now, this is the, the website and software I was mentioning earlier, Stellarium. I use this all the time for everything. It's a free software. The website is, version is a little bit limited, uh, so I would definitely recommend downloading the, the software. It's free and it doesn't take up much space on our, on our hard drive. The also uh, Stellarium app, which I recently discovered, uh, but I'm sure there's so many other stargazing apps that you can also find, uh, which are amazing for when you're at the location and you wanna see what am I looking at or where's this uh, you know, object. You can enter your object in the search bar and it'll point you uh, directly there. So yes, that's, this is the end. I really hope you enjoyed this short talk. I wish I could go on about this for, for hours uh, and hopefully maybe I can answer some of your questions. Uh, so thank you for listening and yeah, let's see what questions you have. Thank you so much. Um, we did get some questions about where to, where to watch. I think we answered that in the, um, in the chat, we had some links, but is there, where, where, do you, where do you go? We all promise not to just show up and just take your, your secret spot, but where do you go? Honestly, I live in the Bay Area, so there, there isn't a lot of spots. Uh, if, if I were to go uh, for the meteor shower, there's a place in Livermore, uh, which um, is really nice. Uh, it's just like sort of parking lot, but it's away from the city lights, uh, which I'm planning to go to. If I'm in the city, I think there's a couple of spots in the north side. I think in the link you might find it. Uh, also, if I'm on campus, I would definitely, and it's open, I would go to the, the roof of Thornton, especially to view uh, stars and planets. I, I'm not sure even with uh, being at the observatory uh, in San Francisco State and in the middle of the night, you, you'd be able to see the meteor shower. San Francisco's light pollution is, is pretty tough. But I would definitely give it a try if you're if you're ever in the area in the future when it is open. I, I can also confirm that here at campus it's pretty overcast. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> the weather as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, someone was asking what sparked your interest in the field. What was kind of your? Oh, that's a great first... question. Uh, honestly, I sort of stumbled upon astronomy uh, when I was uh, like in high school and early undergrad. I, uh, I knew I had an interest in science, but I wasn't good at math. So I tried to find the easiest science field. And I was like, okay, geology isn't too bad. So I decided to do geophysics, but then I realized you still have to do math. So I'm like, okay, if I still have to do uh, math and science, I might as well pick a field that sounds interesting. Uh, and so I looked into astronomy and started studying at San Francisco State and absolutely fell in love. And uh, I'm glad I stumbled upon it. And I'm glad I didn't let my fear of math stop me. 
Well, we were, we're, we're glad that you're here and you, you took an interest in it and you're sharing, being so kind to share it with us tonight. Um, I'm gonna, I have one, one last question for you. Um, are there any other celestial events coming up that we should mark on our calendars? Is there a favorite you have that we wanna make sure that we check out and learn more about? That's a good question. Um, I think in terms of meteor showers, this is the best one and the most visible. Uh, other than that, I don't think this year, I can't, nothing's coming to mind. I'm sure there's something that I'm forgetting. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't recall. I don't know if there's a, any astronomers in the chat want to share any, uh, any objects of interest coming up. But yeah, usually I, I'm looking at data. I'm not, I don't have much time to, to check out the night sky, especially living in the Bay Area. But I don't know, I really enjoy just looking at the planets. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are up early in the night. So this time of year, so. I always just love looking at them, especially through a telescope, even a cheap telescope. It's, it's amazing uh, to look at. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I can think of at this moment. Okay, actually we did get one more question. I'm gonna try to uh, answer this. You can, uh, maybe you can see it in the chat as well, um, which is, I heard on the radio, it's better to watch the meteors after midnight as the world rotates, similar to the rain in more note, is more noticeable in, Front wheel in the front wheel wind shield than the rear wind shield. Um, you said, I don't get it. Can you explain why? Oh, uh, so I, I would say, yeah, uh, between midnight and 4 a.m. is like the peak time. You'll get the most uh, uh, visible uh, meteor uh, meteors because uh, the radiant will be higher in the sky. So you'll be able to see more of it. They'll also be dark enough so that you can see even the dimmest ones. So yeah, that has to do with the yeah like Earth's rotation, where you know, the Earth is rotating more, uh, so that the radiant is higher in the sky. So that that's what causes it. It's like essentially putting, um, yeah, the radiant higher and it being darker. It's perfect conditions to see the most of the the meteors. Well, thank you so much. This was just really fascinating, Hamza, and we 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 can't thank you enough. And um, we hope you'll come back again. <laughs> you and just will come back again one day to uh, to share even more information with us. My pleasure, definitely. I, I would love to. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, everyone. And by the way, I uh, I I saw in the chat that I'm uh, my image apparently is a little blurry. I did try to wipe this down. I'm afraid I'm on some of that antiquated equipment uh, that we mentioned earlier. So. Um, Maybe the blurring is good. I promise I, it wasn't intentional to just mix this up. Um, my, it is now my great pleasure to introduce um, my fellow alumna, and uh, she's the Associate Director of University Events and Protocol at SF State, Charlene Del Muro. She will introduce and lead our Kahoot trivia game. Everyone, if you haven't downloaded it yet, here's information about where to go um, and then put in that game pin. We'll give everyone a minute. Remember, the top three winners are gonna get an alumni swag bag. We have all kinds of fun things. I might see my gator back here keeping me company. Um, so go on that site, start to log in. And it is now my um, pleasure to introduce Charlene. Hello, everybody, and good evening. We are about to start our Kahoot trivia session. Um, you can either go to kahoot.it, which I see that people are already doing, or um, also play on your mobile device if you've already downloaded the app. And um, what we'll be doing is we will um, start it off with a question that is just an icebreaker. It um, is not for points, so first question is not for points. And then we will uh, move into the competition round after that. And so right now we'll just give people um, a couple more moments to um, to get set up and log on if you'd like to play. And if not, you can just enjoy the show and uh, cheer on everyone else. I'll give people about 10 more seconds. Charlene, what was your major at SF State? Um, mine was psychology, which um, 
uh, it, in a lot of ways, is great for event planning with all of the <laughs> troubleshooting you have to do and, uh, you know, working with lots of different people and personality types. And uh, I think I think in the end, it ended up a good choice, even though um, event planning was not what I thought I was going to go into when I majored in it. Okay. So I, I don't think event planning is anyone's <laughs> intention. It certainly <laughs> wasn't mine, but that's, that's where we end up. Yes, it was. It was, my, uh, it was my side gig in college exactly. to uh, earn some money on the side. And then I just ended up liking it and deciding to make that my career path. Great. Okay. So it looks like we're good to go. And I'm just going to. Okay. So everyone, we are ready to start. And this first question again is just an icebreaker. And then after that, we'll move into the competition round. So here we go. Um, good luck, Gators. All right, SF State Gators, are you ready? I was born ready. Hold up, I need a little more time. Game on, chomp. Okay, and it looks like we are uh, ready to get started. And so now I will move on to this next question and this starts the competition round. Oh, and this will be our winner's board too, where we can track and see how everybody's doing and um, who our top three winners will be, who will all get a uh, Gator swag bag. Okay. Einstein said this to which former SF FSFU faculty member? Slow down, professor. I've always had trouble with math. Was it George Gibson, Robert Thornton, Peter Kristoff, or Alexander C. Roberts? Okay, and the correct answer is Robert Thornton, and it looks like we have a lot of very knowledgeable people in this group. And um, I think that's the most we've ever had get this question right. So let's see where we're at. It looks like Mango is in the head, followed by Roberta, Roberto and then Martha. And let's read a little bit more about Robert Thornton. He was the first Dean of SF State's School of Science and the university's first African-American Dean. A theoretical physicist, Thornton worked with Albert Einstein before joining the SF State faculty in 1956. And now on to our next question. What is the most abundant element in the universe? Is it helium, oxygen, carbon, or hydrogen? Okay, and it is hydrogen. It looks like this is going to be a tough competition. Let's see where we're at on our winner's board. So Roberto is taking the lead, followed by Sire Earl and followed by Jeff Gold. So let's see. Um, and then hydrogen, it makes up around 75% of all matter. And now on to our next question. Approximately how old is the universe? Is it 13.8 billion years, 10.7 billion years, 5.2 billion years, or 1.4 billion years? And the correct answer is 13.8 billion years. And it looks like a lot of people got that right. So let's see where we are at now. And it looks like Sire Earl is in first place, followed by Roberto, and that uh, Jeff Gold is starting a uh, winning streak as well. So let's move on to our next question. Which element is the basis of all life as we know it? Is it silicon, oxygen, carbon, or nitrogen?
And the correct answer is carbon. And again, it looks like we have a, a lot of knowledgeable people in this crowd. Uh, let's move on to our next question. Oh, and then winner's board uh, and Jeff Gould takes the lead and is followed by Mangle and then PRP Pete. So let's move on to our next question. What is the name of the comet the Perseids originate from? Is it Neowise, Halley's, Swift Tuttle, or Slow Wabbit? And the correct answer is Swift Tuttle. And let's see where we're at on our winner's board. And Jeff Gould is in the lead, followed by Martha and then Nat. So let's move on to our next question. How long does it take the Perseid Comet 109P to orbit the sun? Is it 133 years, 365 days, 24 hours, or 300 years? And the correct answer is 133 years. Let's see where we're at on our winner's board. And it looks like Jeff Gold is in the lead followed by Nat and then Martha is uh, catching up and uh, getting on a winning streak too. Let's move on to our next question. What is the astronomical name of the point in the sky from where the meteors appear to originate? Is it the meridian, the radian, the zenith or the horizon. And the correct answer is the radiant. And let's move on and see where we're at with our winners. And Jeff Gould is still in the lead, followed by Nat and then PRP Pete is in third place. And let's move on. This is our second to last question. Which color light is best for nighttime observing? Is it blue, red, green, or the color doesn't make a difference, only intensity? And the correct answer is red. And so now we are moving on to our winner's board and let's see where we're at. Oh, Jeff Gold is still in the lead followed by Matt and then PRP Pete is in uh, third place. And so this is our last question. What is a group of alligators called? Is it a basque, a congregation, a pack or a herd? And the correct answer is a congregation, a congregation of gators. So now let's see, we're going to go to our winner's podium. And these are our top three, uh, PRP Pete. And in second place, we have Nat. And our grand prize winner in first place is uh, Jeff Gold. So congratulations to all of you. Um, you will win a Gator swag bag. And um, if you don't have your full name posted, if you could please either message the panelists or post it in the chat, that way we can make sure we reach out to you and get you your Gator goodie bag. And um, thank you so much for playing. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Jessica for some final remarks. So thank you and go Gators. I need to share my screen again. Okay, so once again, everyone, I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, I want to mention a few things, uh, and that's the, physic and, the physics and astronomy department has both a planetarium and an observatory in Thornton Hall. Um, of course, because of COVID, these won't be open right away, um, but you can go to the websites for each and get updates as to when public nights will resume. Dr. Adrian Cool is the director of both and is monitoring the ever evolving situation that we're dealing with. Um, also, if you are not an astronomer, but are interested in contributing to Astronomers for Planet Earth in some way, we do have a donate button on our website um, at astronomersforplanet.org. 
earth. Um, please feel free to reach out also if there are any other ways that you feel you can participate. This is an all hands on deck situation where people from all backgrounds and all professions need to come together to find effective solutions to the climate crisis. So thank you, have a great night and uh, keep looking up. All right, I need to I, I mute myself. There we go. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica and Hamsa. Uh, your presentation tonight was just absolutely fascinating. I have to be honest, I came in tonight. I didn't think I was going to understand one thing, but you both just made it really just so um, approachable and accessible. And I just I really, really appreciate that, that there, there was some great content for people who are absolutely in the know, clearly from our, our, our the amazing results on our quiz. Um, and then to people like me for who this is all very new. So uh, good luck on your ongoing research. We are just absolutely proud to call you both Gators. Um, and congratulations to our trivia winners. Uh, make sure that we're going to get your contact information so we can send you your S of State goodie bags. Um, I also want to thank our uh, alumni and event team members who made tonight possible. Nisha, Ken, and Charlene, well done. It is my great pleasure to get to work with you. So I'm going to give you a round of applause. Hopefully everyone else is as well. I know it's a little quiet. <laughs> It was just me clapping that you can hear, but uh, this, this, was a, this was a fun night. So thank you so much. Um, we have some information to share with you that there, we're gonna put that up on the screen. That's gonna include a QR code. That's gonna take you to upcoming programming. So everybody make sure, point your camera, get that information and join us for some of our other events that are coming up. Um, and finally, thank you to all of you out there in the universe. Uh, um, there are just endless ways that you could spend your time and we are so thrilled that you chose to spend it with us. So have a wonderful evening and I hope tonight's presentation will help you look at the stars in a whole new way. Good night and go Gators. This concludes our program this evening and the webinar will end shortly. Thank you again for attending Gays and Gators and we hope you will join us for the rest of our summer series events and activities. Thank you and go Gators.